I'm Christopher Nolikin at Belgian Veterinary Hospital. Hi, I'm Lindsay Benzulo. Talking today about allergies and pets. Spaying and neutering your pet. Pet weight management. And we're going to talk today about pet summer fun and safety. Okay. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but doctor. Mm-hmm. So she says, I got yeah, a lot good, of good You got a lot of treats. A lot of TV treats. Up on that table. <laughs> Hi, welcome back uh, to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lindsay Renzulo. I'm Dr. Christopher Nolikin. Uh, we're glad to have you back. And today in studio, we have a very special guest. Um, we have a veterinary technician joining us. Um, her name is Patty Page. Welcome, Patty, to our show. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Patty, would you tell us what your official role is with um, Ethos Veterinary Group? Sure. Uh, my official title is Technician Clinical Educator. And to break that down quite simply, it just means that I help to bring clinical training experiences to our technicians here on the East Coast. Awesome, fantastic, really exciting. Yeah, so, so tell us a little bit about being a technician. What is, what is that job profession? Uh, so to put it quite simply, we are really uh, veterinary nurses. So we are the nurses for, um, for our dogs and our cats um, and our exotics. Uh, we support doctors mm -hmm. throughout their day. Um, so we deliver vaccines, we draw blood, uh, we take x-rays, we perform anesthesia, so we assist in anesthesia. Um, there's a litany of things that we actually do as veterinary technicians. Yeah, and I feel like it very much like they're nurses because I can't even imagine. You know, you hear a lot of people say that mm -hmm. sometimes in hospitals, even though you have doctors that might perform the surgeries and stuff, that we would not survive without the nurses. I mean, mm -hmm. it is one of those things. Being a vet without our veterinary technicians, they really are the heart and soul. We we need them desperately in the hospital. And realistically, that's like when I say I want to do blood work, it's the technicians doing the things like we may say this is what I want to do but it doesn't get done without right the technicians, the technicians perform the phlebotomy we run the lab machines we may do the manual differentials mm -hmm. so we're the ones actually doing and then reporting back mm -hmm. uh, we do spend a lot of our time with patients themselves yep. so while you have a lot of times with clients maybe in the room with clients and the pets once you leave there and then give us a treatment sheet or give us, you know, a list of what you want. On a paper um, towel. On a paper towel. <laughs> um, it is then our job to then execute that and care for that patient as well as report back any findings that we might find, how they respond to treatments. And I do find that with the technicians, especially when we have patients that we have hospitalized, that you are the first line of defense or you're the first observers when something is changing, you know, you don't think the patient's doing well, they're starting to change the way they're breathing. Um, the technicians are very in tune with all of those patients. We are. Say. And as a technician, it's our job to be the patient advocate. So it's yep. our job to speak up for those patients. They don't have a voice. They can't tell us where it hurts. They can't tell us that they're now feeling nauseous because we gave them a med medication that's going to make them vomit. It's our jobs as technicians to actually really um, very diligently monitor our, t our, our patients so that way we can report these back. And we've actually had a few of our technicians go on to nursing careers, like actually human, human nursing, nursing careers. Yeah. And, and a lot of those, you know, human nurses actually come back and do some hours, you know, in the veterinary field still as a veterinary nurse or veterinary technician still because the career paths are somewhat similar in a lot of, a lot of they ways. They are quite similar, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so why, what is that difference between being called a nurse? Why do you think, why are veterinary technicians not traditionally called nurses? Hmm. Um, it, it is just, it's not our title. Just it's just not yeah. our title. So conventionally we are called veterinary technicians. Mm -hmm. um, right now there is a veterinary nursing initiative, which mm -hmm. is, um, you know, uh, NAVTA, the North American Veterinary Technicians Association, are moving forward with this initiative to educate clients and owners, pet owners, as well as, um, you know, uh, people in the field about what veterinary technicians do. Mm -hmm. Um, it's actually a really exciting time for our veterinary yeah. technician profession. Um, you know, I related a lot to my, my, my grandmother as a nurse, and so back when she was a nurse, and even before she became a nurse, um, it was a lot of on-the-job training. So nurses didn't go and become educated on how to be nurses. They were uh, essentially apprentices. Yep. So they were taught by their you know, medical doctors about how to care for patients. And you know, they were on-the-job trained. Mm -hmm. And um, 
through organization, um, you know, they got together and decided what the standard should be for nurses, and that's how, you know, RVNs came about, mm -hmm. LVNs, um, you know, even medical assistants. Yep. And so right now, that's sort of where our field is, our profession is at this point in time. You know, we're rallying together, we're trying to determine what we should call ourselves, mm -hmm. um, we're trying to determine, you know, what these standards should be. Um, and we're also trying to educate owners because that is um, where it, there is a, a deficit. Owners don't really understand what we do or, or how, how involved we can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. Yeah. So how do you become a, a veterinary technician? Let's say somebody watches this and they say, I want to be just like Patty. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be. Well, don't, don't do it the way I did it. <laughs> well, it's also a changed a lot. It I mean, has like from where it had been, from where it is right now today. Right. So, um, the, the conventional way would be a bricks and mortar school. So many states require that you a attend an accredited program, meaning it's an accredited through the AVMA. Yep. Um, and it can be either two year associates uh, of applied science and veterinary technology, or it could be a bachelor's of science in veterinary technology, it depends on the school you go to. And uh, provided it's accredited from there, um, you then, and you graduate. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, you then um, are eligible to sit for the VTNE, which stands for the Veterinary Technicians National Exam. And this is sort of a, um, it's a credentialing exam, it's a standardization. So it says that everybody who's passed this exam has a, has a basic level or has the level of knowledge that we require as a profession. Yep. Um, and then from there you go on to certify in your state. So you get become credentialed in your state. And so, so far there are um, titles such as Certified Veterinary Technician, which is what we have in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Uh, we have a Licensed vet Veterinary Technician, which you find um, in Maine and New York. Um, you can have a Registered Veterinary Technician, I think California are RVTs. And um, there is also an LV, I think it's an LVMT. Mm. So it's mm. a Licensed Veterinary Medical Technician, I think if I got that correctly. Mm. But those are the four distin yeah. distinguished um, certification. Just depending on the state that you're in. It does. It also yeah. depends on whether or not you're required to become certified. So certain states like New York, you have to be a licensed veterinary technician to practice as a veterinary technician. Um, in states such as Massachusetts and New, New Hampshire, you don't. Mm -hmm. So credentialing is considered voluntary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So by becoming credentialed, I have agreed that I'm going to, you know, maintain a, a standard of care, but I've also agreed that I'm going to go and continue to educate myself. So I I acquire at least, if not more, 12, um, you know, uh, uh, CEUs a year, yeah. and that way I'm empowering my brain, but I'm also imparting that information on technicians that I work with, too. Yeah, and they require the same things as veterinarians that we have, you know, a standard that you will have to do a certain mm -hmm. amount of continuing education hours every year, just so we, you know, are sort of staying up on the the changes in medicine. Medicine changes, yeah. right? Medicine yep. changes, and depending on what profession you're in or what uh, discipline you're in, I mean, as an emergency technician, the things that I need to know as an emergency technician is, are not the same things that a dental technician needs to yeah. know. So, you know, what I would go for for continuing education, would I would not go to a dentist. <laughs> and education. Yes, no. <laughs> it might be interesting, <laughs> but not going to help you. Yeah, yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so beyond, uh, beyond your name, you have a lot of little initials. Okay. So will you explain, like, what the, all those rankings right, are? Right, what those rankings are. So <laughs> um, I am a CVT, so I'm a certified veterinary technician. I have taken the VTNA and passed, and I and I uh, successfully met the requirements in the state of uh, Massachusetts as well as New Hampshire to become certified. So I'm a certified veterinary technician. I also am a veterinary technician specialist in the discipline of emergency and critical care. So what did you have to do to yeah. achieve those credentials? That's uh, it's very involved, yeah. um, and so it's roughly a three-year process. So mm -hmm. after becoming certified, you need at least three years' experience within your discipline. So basically, submerged in that discipline, um, in order to acquire the knowledge, uh, to acquire the skill sets, because there's specific skill sets that you need as a veterinary technician in emergency. Um, and then you need to then apply to sit for the exam. And so to apply, it's a year's worth of collecting cases that you've worked on to uh, prove your, not only your skill sets, but that you've worked with a number of different cases. Um, and in, in, in critical care as well as emergency, um, you write four case reports. Basically, they're five pages of, uh, they're, they're so tedious. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> 
so and and your application is submitted. Uh, once your application is submitted, it's reviewed by a committee, mm -hmm. and so three individuals that review your application. They decide whether or not you have what it takes to be a veterinary uh, technician specialty specialist in emergency and critical care. Um, and then once that gets approved, once your application gets approved, they say you can now sit for the exam. So then there's an exam that's only given once a year um, at our national um, uh, at our national conference, um, and uh, you sit for that exam. If you pass, then you can call yourself. You can use the designation veterinary technician specialist. Mm -hmm. You don't happen to know. I mean, this is sort of off off the cuff too. How many BTSs there are like in the country? I do. Right? do you There's know that? fifteen. There's fifteen currently recognized VTSs. Wow. Um, Wait, with you're talking more. about the specialties, the, the speci different different specialties, different different specialties. specialties. And then do you know how many technicians are actually? Wow, you're getting really specific. I just want to know. Like, I, I don't. I don't. I wonder so how many there are. I'm sure that's look Googleable. I should Google it later. Google. We'll Google it later. <laughs> right, Dr. Yeah. Google on, yeah. on the search. It just doesn't, it seems like such a daunting task. And, uh, you know, is, we're trying to definitely encourage so many technicians to go on and do it. Um, but just percentage wise, I wonder if it's just low. So it's daunting, um, but it was also created. So the ECC, the Emergency and Critical Care VTS, was actually one of the first that was established. Um, and when Harold Davis and a group of his cohorts uh, put this together, uh, the purpose was to kind of mirror that of our veterinary counterparts. And yep. so in veterinary medicine, you can get your DVM or your VMD, depending on what, what, what college you go to or yep. what university you go to. Um, and then you can choose to specialize. And so in that specialty, specialty it, it is a three-year process, right? right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very, it's not exact, right. but it's very similar. And the purpose is, is not to be exclusive, right? but it's supposed to be very hard. Yeah. And it's supposed to bring out your knowledge. And it's supposed to really identify those that have the skill sets in this, uh, yeah. in this specialty. That's definitely an accomplishment. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that it's an optional thing becoming a CVT or obviously a VTS as well. So what, is, what are other pathways for people to become a technician if they don't go to the traditional brick and mortar school? So I didn't go to a traditional brick and mortar school. Um, I am what is considered an on the job trained. Um, mm -hmm. I've been in this field for oh, almost 20 years. Yeah. Um, and in all honesty, I was 16 years old or 17 years old maybe and I walked in, I wanted, I was pre-vet, so I loved animals and just like everybody who goes into this field, <laughs> you know, you just want to come and you just want to take care of animals and right. so that, that's where I was when I was a young teenager and I walked into my local vet practice, um, it's a one doctor practice and I literally walked in the day they opened, I didn't know this, I walked in and I just, I wanted hands-on experience yeah. and so I walked in and um, it was Townsend Vet Practice and Dr. B.J. Meunier and I said, hey, I just really want to work with animals. I, I plan on going to college. I'm pre-vet and you know, I need my hands-on experience in order to, so when I apply for vet school, I have this experience. I hear that it's really necessary. <laughs> and he said to me, we just opened today. It's ironic you showed up. Um, and I remember he's like, I can't pay you. And I said, great, I'll leave for free. I'm going to work for free. <laughs> And back then, uh, there weren't such, such uh, there weren't liabilities that there are now, yes, and you I have know. to worry about those liability insurances. And so, he allowed me to work for a couple weeks. Uh, I think I volunteered for free, but then he, I was part of, uh, I was a paid employee. Oh, that's great. Um, and that's sort of where it started. Um, and so, I am an on the job. So to get back to your question, I'm sorry, a little yeah, tangent. Okay. I'm on the job trained technician, and so I have essentially um, been um, really blessed with the practices I've been working in um, and the mentorship that I've gotten. And so without them, I don't know that I would have been able to do what I did. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I, I obtained enough years experience. I was, I took the VT&E um, back when the layperson could walk in off the street and take it. Um, mm -hmm. Before we had all of these requirements for the VT&E um, and I passed and I went on to become certified um, yeah. and I still maintain my CVT to this day. Um, but I don't re re recommend you go that <laughs> route. <laughs> but there are still ways for on-the-job trained technicians to become certified. Mm -hmm. um, and, it's, and it's highly, um, uh, we do uh, recommend it. Mm -hmm. um, and to do that, there, there is one state that still will uh, support um, out-of-state technicians. Uh, um, I believe it is uh, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, they support, they will sponsor out-of-state technicians provided they have a letters of recommendation, they have so many years experience, clinical experience in the field. Um, and you write and you petition to them, and if they approve you, then you then you get permission to sit for the VTNE. 
Yeah. So with within Ethos, sort of the company that you work for, the company mm -hmm. that we work for, um, you know, what kind of programs do we offer for people that are interested in becoming veterinary technicians or that are technicians wanting to excel? We have uh, we have a lot of uh, programs, both for the technician that um, comes from a bricks and mortar school and the technician that comes, you know, who is not certified or credentialed. Um, and so it starts all the way with veterinary assisting. And so Ethos actually has one of the first, if not the only, accredited veterinary assisting program found within the hospitals. Uh, this program is not only um, offered to our veterinary assistants um, as, they're, as they come in. So veterinary assistants are basically the support to the technicians. They are the support. They come in and they set up for procedures. They break down procedures. And they, they have no experience. These people have they had have no, no experience. They have no experience. Right? Nine times out of ten, these yep. people come in off the street because they love animals. Yep. Right? Yep. They have zero experience. Um, and this is a, anywhere from a four to six month program. It's found online, so we do house all of our curriculum on VetBloom. Um, and so they can, uh, kind of self-guided, uh, go through this program. During this time, they are working as a veterinary assistant in a hospital, in a fast-paced hospital, and they're also learning from their technician mentors around them. Um, once they finish and complete this program, um, and meet all of the requirements that NAFTA has set forth, then they can sit for their um, credentialing exam. And yeah. then, if once passing that, they can call themselves an approved veterinary assistant. Yeah. Um, it doesn't stop there, though, because in the states of uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire, um, because you, it's not required, and because technicians are really hard to come by, to be quite honest with you, yeah. um, it behooves us to be able to then train these technicians on the job in the field. And so we as a company, as a group of hospitals, have all decided that uh, there's a right way to do this and a wrong way to do this. And we've really tried to strive for um, the best in medical standard. And so we have a protocol system mm -hmm. uh, set, you know, put in place. Um, again, all housed online, but this protocol system not only has, you know, didactic training, so there's readings involved, um, and we also have practical experience that you have to prove your, prove your skills um, in order to then, you know, move on up um, in the ladder. And so, you know, it starts in the basic, and the basics are just that. They're basics. It's anatomy and physiology. It's basic husbandry. It's basic, you know, zoonosis, yep. um, immunology. And, you know, it, it builds on that from there, you know, basic phlebotomy, you know, and all the way up to the level four. So a level four would be the highest, and that would be the most advanced technician that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I really do like it. I mean, working in a hospital that has the different levels, you do see the technicians wanting to get, you know, to that next level, mm -hmm. you know, t looking for ways that they can get signed off on different procedures or be involved, and they definitely, I think it gives them something to strive for, so I, I like it, yeah. It's also really great for um, even technicians coming from a school, coming from an accredited program. Yeah. A lot of times they come in, they're new hires, and in my job I get to work with a lot of these technicians. But think about yourselves as young veterinarians. Like yeah. when you came out of school and you got, you know, you got that shiny, you know, I'm a, now a DVM, right? Um, you went on maybe for an internship for a year. Is that enough experience? Did you have enough right. under your belt to feel like you really right. knew what you were doing? Um, I mean, and the first time you get vaccines, which sounds so obvious. Oh yeah, you're shaking and everything. And the same thing with the technicians. Right. They come out of school. Right. And they don't necessarily have the practical. Experience. Yeah, they don't. They don't have the practical clinical experience. And so, you know, part of these protocols, we do require that our, you know, our certified technicians go through this as well. This is not just for on-the-job techni technicians, but it's so that we know that all of our technicians, based on what level that they are at, um, all are proficient at the yep. skills that are within that level. Yeah, it's a really good program. I like that. Yeah, and I mean, from a hiring perspective as well, like, you know, you might be listening to this and be a little like overwhelmed by like, wow, there's all these letters in the CVT and there's on the job and there's this, but you know, the basic idea is that why would I, why would someone go and be a VTS when in theory they could be on the job trained to that level? And they could, most certainly we have technicians yeah. that are incredibly skilled. They are at the level of probably a lot of VTSs, but realistically, if they went to apply to a different position, you just don't, you don't know. You know if that person has a VTS beside their name, well, they know how to place a central line. They know how to do, you know, these different tasks, and I'm going to basically be able to put them there and able to run, whereas somebody else may have those skills, but you're kind of taking their word for it, right. really. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so what about different kind of job categories? So you're in emergency, critical care. Yep. Um, what are some other things that technicians can be in the world? 
So back when I was a young technician, it was just general practice, general practice. right? Yeah. And um, I knew a lot of technicians who were in the field who left the field because they felt very stagnant. Yeah. Um, that there was really no job growth. And mm -hmm. in all honesty, uh, being in the field, I'm a relic in the sense that most veterinary technicians leave the profession within five years hmm. um, because they feel like there's no growth, because they feel like you know there's you know no opportunities, um, you know for other reasons. Um, but there's a lot, there's a lot mm -hmm. out there. So general practice is the first and foremost. Yes. There's a lot of general practices that need really great technicians. Specialty emergency medicine, uh, obviously, mm -hmm. would be the yeah. second. Um, you know, what we also find is that young technicians coming out of school, they don't te technically, they don't necessarily think that they can apply to emergency and specialty mm. because it's very um, overwhelming to them. Yeah. They feel like they don't have the skills or nobody would want them. Yep. Um, and I, if you're watching this, um, I would like to say that is furthest from the yeah. truth, right? Yeah. Um, we would much rather have you come in with your, you know, fresh book knowledge and we can build on that, right, um, than for you to go to, a, you know, a small general practice. Yeah. Um, you and know, get to, burned to out. To feel like, yeah. right, exactly, to get burned out, right? Yeah. Um, so anyway, so uh, moving on, you could go into, you know, zoology, you could go into zoo work. I do know technicians that actually um, have gone and done that. You could work in an aquarium. Mm -hmm. um, you could do behavior. And mm -hmm. so now there's a VTS in behavior. Well, so, that's very cool. You know, so that if that's nutrition. something. Nutrition. Nutrition. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. right? Um, there is, and there's lab sciences. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't like to work with people, um, but <laughs> and there are some of us that really realize yeah. we get out here and we love dogs and cats, but we don't realize that they're attached to a leash or they're attached yep. to a carrier. Yeah. And uh, there's a fair amount of client education that happens as on the part of the veterinary Definitely. technician. Um, there is lab sciences. There are mm -hmm. avenues that you can go into. Um, and in that, you could go to some place like um, an IDEX or an Antec and do you know process lab work over and over. And there are people, there are geeks like myself who would love to do that. Yeah. Um, or you can go in and actually work with a scientist mm -hmm. um, who are doing research in specific areas. Um, and their job, the, this technician's job, would be to to care for those animals. Yeah. So what are what is your what are your favorite parts of your job or a favorite part of your job? Oh, well, I would have to say that the teaching aspect is yeah. probably my favorite part, and that's what's led me to my position that's now. That's why you have a position yeah. as a teacher. Um, I've always been one to uh, just find a lot of compassion, satisfaction out of teaching others and helping others have those aha moments. Um, and so that's something that I really love. I think you know. Secondly, I love patient care. I yeah. love the one-on-one. -on -one Critical care. I mean, if you give me a septic abdomen, I am literally in my glory. <laughs> Which means a very bad infection inside it the does, belly. It does, <laughs> right? Um, it's probably the worst of the worst. Yeah. But for some reason, I just because you have to, you have to use your brain, you have to be on on your game, um, and you have to have a you, you're part of the medical team yeah. when when you're dealing with those cases. And so those are some things that I love. Well, one of the very cool things about your role now, Patty, is that you're able to be a teacher, but you're actually still doing clinical stuff. So it's not like yep. you're only doing you know just you know book work or just computer stuff, you actually are going into the emergency room with the technicians and right. actively training them and teaching them, which is very cool. And that's the time I get most excited. Yeah. So when I go back on the clinic floor after maybe doing some book work or you know putting something together and I have to teach about, oh, do you know the blood volume of this teeny tiny little <laughs> small right. teeth? And everybody goes, oh, I haven't really thought of it. Yes. And I get really excited because I can teach some of <laughs> Yes. <laughs> very cool. Yeah, so, you know, thank you so much for coming today. Thanks for I think having yeah, me. Yeah, we love to have you. It's very yeah. interesting. There's lots of different avenues. <laughs> There's, um, I mean, I think the biggest thing is, is like, you know, as, you know, Krista was saying earlier, is that, you know, try not to get too overwhelmed because there are a lot of different ways that you can sort of go about it. But at the end of the day, it's figuring out if you really want to be around animals, if you love this field, that we have opportunities for you. So, you and know. It's not just becoming a vet. You know, a lot of our technicians get asked this question, are you studying to be a vet? Yes, I've and I, that I feel before. like I've I know that, that before. you know they're being you're being asked that only with good intentions, you know. But the reality is sometimes that really makes it sound as though your profession is not worthy, and it's an amazing profession, and it's a necessary one, and it's one that people can and should go into as a profession, not as a hopping off point to something exactly. else. Right. Exactly. So, because yeah. like we talked about earlier in the segment, I mean, your job role is very different than what we do as well. I mean, there are some overlaps, but for, you know, there are very distinct differences between the two. So, yeah. um, and they're, you're very valued and needed. Thank you very <laughs> much. You. Thank you. <laughs> so this um, marks the end of our season one, which is, um, 
the last time we will be recording here at the studio. Which it's is very sort of sad bittersweet. For us. I mean, we've gotten used to the whole get up, the setup, the studio, the helpers, everybody's been amazing yeah. here. So, but we're moving to a new format. So we're going to be doing um, we're going to be doing Facebook Live. So we're going to be having our same audio feed that we have on your podcast, um, whatever your preferred podcast, as uh, iTunes, iTunes or whatever Android yeah. is. And we're also going to be on live recording, so no bleeping stuff. Yeah, oh. we can't. We this <laughs> no takes. There's going to be no, no cut. We're going to have to just do live. No, we live. never do takes, but we're definitely not going to do takes. So you're going to be able to get on there while we're recording and actually ask us questions in real time. Uh, we'll still be putting up the videos, and we'll still be doing the audio, and then also that. So we'll be recording over back at the hospital at Bulger. And um, so this is the end of season one, and that will be season two next month. And so signing off from the uh, the podcast. Yeah. I'm Krista Vernalikin. I'm Lindsay Renzuel. Thank you so much and for joining us. And thank you, thank Patty, you. for coming in Thanks today. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. See you next time.